Morning, everybody. It's great to see you all here this morning. Well, if I'm not mistaken, this is Palm Sunday. So I'm going to begin this morning with a little reading here from Luke and chapter 19, and it's just a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you'll find a colt tied in which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anybody asks you, what it, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep quiet, the stones themselves would immediately cry out. Amen. Well, what a glorious picture of the Lord entering Jerusalem on that final week to effect our salvation. And we're going to stand together now. Suzanne's going to lead us and we're going to sing his praise this morning. God. Jesus. 
So this is going to continue to lead us now as we stand for our hymn, God of Grace. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. (coughs) Father, we come to worship and adore you. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather your people unto yourself, that we might lift our voices and express our hearts and our gratitude to you for all that you have done for us, Lord. Through this great salvation you have brought us into, through the, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for that cleansing that goes deep as the deepest stain and makes us whiter than snow. Father, you have done great things and your blood, Lord Jesus, has availed much for us. And Lord, we thank you today. We bless you, Lord. Father, we pray that you would move by your spirit among us in this hour. Lord, that you would touch our lives, bring healing and deliverance and salvation. Lord, accept our praise this morning. We offer it to you, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, we've got some announcements this morning, and I might elongate it a little bit, if that's okay. Even if it's not, I might do it. Because um, some of you are asking, how did you get to be here? And I assume you're asking me that in a nice way. So, <laughs> so I'll maybe say something about that. First of all, I want to thank our, give our very best wishes and God's blessing on Carl and Emma tomorrow. I reckon, Carl, by about two o'clock, you'll be married. (laughs) And that's a wonderful thing, for the scripture says, doesn't it? He who finds a wife finds a good thing. And uh, we've met Emma. We know she loves the Lord. You found a good thing. The Lord's blessed you. And pray for you tomorrow that you'll just have a, a life of blessing together. 
And of course, it's at half one. If you're able to go along to that in Bangor West tomorrow, you can witness that great event, and uh, you'd be very welcome there too. Now, we're continuing to pray for Fergus. For Fergus, Mr. Bell is in hospital, and we continue to remember him in our prayers, that God will bless him and be with him and strengthen and comfort him and the Bell family too. I want to thank God as well because we see answer to some of our prayers. Karina is back with us here and Eddie's back with us. And so God moves in power to touch and heal. And we want to thank him for that as well. In your little bulletin, you'll find also a, a list of names there at the top, just as you open it up, of various folks who need your prayers at the moment. And of course, we pray for them here week by week. But we're going to continue that. You can pray for them every day. And those little names there will help you to remember who it is. There's a big turnout here yesterday. Uh, for the car wash in support of Ukraine. And you'll see in your bulletin it says there that raising £800, well, I was speaking to Darren this morning, he said it's more like 1200 at the moment. So we really thank God for that. And uh, folks got their car washed while they had their bacon buddies and all the rest. So well done, everybody, and all the folks who made that happen. Uh, it was tremendous. I was just... Uh, Knocked off my feet, actually, when I saw the size of the operation. I thought uh, I'd be down here and a couple of fellas putting the cars through, but it was much, much bigger than that, and uh, really tremendous. So well done. And that <laughs> Johnny has put a wee notice here. Maybe it wasn't, but it's his name on it. If anybody has church keys they no longer require, please return them to Johnny Gray. That's for his key collection. <laughs> But just while we mention Johnny, Johnny's heading off to Rwanda tomorrow. He's leaving tomorrow. He'll arrive there on Tuesday. I think it's with work. Uh, but we want to pray for Johnny, that the Lord will bless him there. Because uh, Rwanda's not going to know what's hit them, Johnny, are they? <laughs> so we just pray for him now. Father, we just want to thank you for Johnny, for his life, for his love for you, and all the gifts that you've poured into his life. We thank you for his family and for Emma and the kids. And Lord, as he would go tomorrow, we pray you'd take care of his family, that you'd bless him. And watch over them. Keep them safe this week. And the very same thing for Johnny himself, Lord. That you'll watch over him. You'll go before him in the way. You'll keep him out of harm's way. But make him a blessing. And Father, that the things that he will see and what you will show him. We pray, Lord God, that you would grant him understanding of those things. Grant him insight. And Lord, we just pray your blessing upon him. That that trip would be successful in every way. And you bring him back, Lord, safe and sound and unaffected, Lord, by any illness whatsoever. Pray you'll watch over him, keep him safe. We thank you for him and for Emma and the children also. In Jesus' name, amen. Pat Heron is having a retirement service, and that will be on the 29th of April in Bangor Free Methodist Church, beginning at 7.30. Everybody's welcome to that as well. Other dates there you'll see in your diary is a Good Friday communion service and a time for sharing God's goodness. So if you have a testimony to God's goodness, which we all have, you're welcome to come and share it that evening from 7.30. There'll be tea, coffee and biscuits in the hub afterwards. And uh, you'll see various times there of the, the services on Sunday as well. We want to wish Rita Hutton a very happy birthday and pray that God will bless her uh, with another great year. In Jesus' name, amen to that. Now, I did say I was going to say something about how we got to be here. So I'll say that now. I prepared a little thing. Now, it all went back to when I visited Pastor Norman in hospital. And I had just finished my ministry in Bangor and I had resigned from there. And I went to see Norman and I thought, I'll let Norman know. He was quite surprised, you know, he hadn't seen that coming. And then uh, he recovered very quickly, of course, from his surprise. And he laughed, you know, as we laugh, ha <laughs> ha, buddy, the Lord might bring you to Park Avenue. <laughs> And uh, I said, well, Norman, that's not my plan, but if, if that's the Lord's will, obviously I'll go, because I, I just couldn't see myself taking on anything at that stage. Um, I was very tired. I needed a good rest. So I began a little cottage industry at home. I turned a lifelong hobby into a, very, into a little small business, and that began to grow. The Lord blessed it over the two-year period that we, the COVID was in operation, you know, and uh, that took off. At the same time, that was all happening. Suzanne finished her job in Tarview School, where she'd been for years, and uh, she began then working with a friend of ours. We had a ceramic uh, studio in Belfast, and she's working there to this day, and that, that was a real blessing. 
And then the Lord led us to sell our house in Bangor as well, so we did that. So he's just uprooting us all together. And he opened up a place for us to rent in Glastry. Some of you have been there now. And as Phil said the night that we were inducted here, it's another country far, far away, you know. <laughs> but um, it's, it's down the peninsula. And we had never thought of ourselves living down there, but that's where the Lord opened up. And it's been a blessed year for us in Glastry. It's just been really good. And then we thought uh, maybe the future for us would be itinerant preaching. Just getting wee invites here and there, working Susanna to wee business, me at mine, and taking up invitations to speak in different churches as the Lord led us. And who knows what that would open up in, in time to come. But uh, we were open to the idea as well of church planting and even of leaving the Free Methodist Church altogether. We were just completely open to whatever God had for us. But the invitations did come in, uh, but nearly all of them were in Free Methodist churches as the different pastors all took their sabbaticals about the same time. So we just went from six weeks to six weeks to six weeks in about three of our Free Methodist churches uh, while we were preaching here as well. For John Thompson had rung me up and he had said, um, would you be free to speak here? And we said, oh, I surely will come down, you know, and that went really well. And after a little while, he said, would you think about coming to help the leaders here and help us find a new pastor? I said, yeah, we'll do that as well. So we came alongside then and began to, to meet with you and did that for over a year. And so we were in the prayer meetings, praying our hearts out, well, I was anyway, for praying our heart out with you and saying, Lord, get him ready, reveal him, Lord, bring him, and all the rest of it, and actively seeking uh, another pastor for the church. Of course, the back of my mind, of course, uh, there was the thought that it could be you. And, uh, but I had prayed about that, and the Lord had said no. So I took that as that's it, set in stone, it's never going to happen. No is no. And we carried on. And then one, meet, one Wednesday night, Albert, he just prayed it out in the Wednesday night prayer meeting. And he said, Lord, send Jeremy to be our pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know whether to say amen or not. <laughs> and then there was Paul Bell through the year. I met with Paul there a number of times. And he said, sure, it's obvious, isn't it? And I liked you all, of course, we were getting on great. Um, but as far as I was concerned, the Lord had said no. So we kept us looking for a pastor. And Pat Heron, whose um, retirement is coming up, she said to me as well, she said, you know, God can move in ways you're not expecting. He can say no for a time, and then he can say yes. And of course, the no was to give me time to get rested up. And then another friend, uh, she rang up and she said, you know, the Lord can change his mind on these things. No can be for a season. And then he can say yes. And then I visited Henry and Dorothy at their wee caravan down there in Malisle. And uh, Henry said to me, he said, well, you know, the Lord could lead you into Park Avenue in a gradual sort of way. And I said, well, it's possible. And you know, these things are all in my head, of course. Other people said it here as well. And in some ways it did seem obvious it was a good fit. And it was often prayed in the prayer meeting, Lord, make the man of your choice ready. And of course, I was amening to that as well, not realizing fully it was me. And Suzanne was being prepared too, but she was strides ahead of me. I don't know, men, if you find that, you will find that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> often your wife's there before you, you know. So she was there before me. And uh, it was obvious God had given us favor among you. And... We're getting, you know, we're, we're seeing all of that and appreciating it. And eventually I began to sense, you know, the last one to know, I began to sense that the Lord was saying, Jeremy, this is the next step for you. This is what I have for you and Suzanne and Park Avenue together. And so I began thinking about coming on a, a full-time basis and began to pray into that. And I began to ask the Lord in earnest, to confirm his call because I wasn't going to do anything if I wasn't sure that the Lord wanted me to come. And so I was a bit nervous about it all. And I really began to pray and say, Lord, you have to show me clearly what's going on here. And then Suzanne became a member of the church. <laughs> now that was, that was out of the ordinary. And we, we had talked about the need to have a home church. And we thought, well, Park Avenue is great and we love it here and we all get on. This would be a great place to be our home church even when the next pastor comes along. So we thought, that's great. And then Suzanne said, well, I'm going to become a member next week. I said, right, okay. So I was saying, Lord, show us what you want us to do here. 
And at the end of the meeting one, this Sunday morning, when Suzanne came into membership, I was standing down there at the door, and Jude Murray comes up to me, looks me in the eye and says, you're our next pastor. <laughs> and then she went out, and I think she went home and said, Tommy, I don't know what I've said. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking, that's remarkable. And John Thompson, he was standing there, and he said, well, Suzanne coming into membership really complicates our relationship now, doesn't it? <laughs> So all this was coming on, you know, and I was thinking, right, okay, I get you. And I'd just been praying, Lord, show me for sure. And you can't argue with that. And then that night, Dean was speaking, and his reading really spoke to me. There were two parts to it, and one was that um, talked about Jesus' teaching ministry with authority. And then the next thing what he talked about was becoming fishers of men. And both those things are very much in my heart. I, I, I believe God's given me a teaching gift. That seems to be the main thing that I have. And so that really spoke to me. And then this idea about reaching out to see others saved. And that would be very much in my heart as well. And this church, it's really what keep, makes you work. You know, it's this thing that's very much um, just comes across so strongly from you. So those two things, the Lord spoke to me about them as well. And he said, this is where I have for you. And so one thing I'm not good at, and uh, you'll all know now, is carrying on the daily administration of the church. It really wears me out because it's not my gifting. And so I need others around me to help with that. Uh, but let me preach and witness and visit people. I'm happy all day. But a further confirmation was the general acceptance and approval by you and also the appointment by the ministry board. That could have stopped anything happening, but they didn't. They said, okay, that sounds good. So I'm convinced that I'm here where God has called me to be. And I resisted the call when God said, no, I wasn't ready. But one morning I woke up and I said to Suzanne, Suzanne, I'm ready for full-time ministry. Not thinking that it was here. I was just knew I was ready. And a friend of ours who would pray for us often, she rang up the same morning and she said, the Lord says you're ready. I said, that's, that's right. <laughs> and everything lined up quickly and moved on from that moment and here we are. But I have the conviction as well, and this is important, that one man cannot oversee the local church. I've already told you one of my, my weaknesses. It's, it's not a strength of strength in other areas, but one man can't oversee the local church. So I really value the team of John Thompson, Phil and Johnny. And I agreed to come here full time if they would remain part of the leadership team with me and we would work together to lead the church. So no backing out. <laughs> and they, they did, they said, yes, we'll work together as a team. It's working well. And we did that for about a year and it worked really well and we get on well together. There's a good, a good thing happening there. So the four of us are gonna lead the church with the board's help. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what we're born for and I'm loving it, so we're, we're getting stuck in. And I want to recognize the work of John Thompson and Phil and Johnny, and also Miriam and Janice and Ian and latterly Tom, uh, who made up the board there this, this, for quite a long time actually. Their service has been remarkable and outstanding right through Norman's illness right after Norman went to heaven, and they continue to lead the church, hold things together, and move into that. And of course, it was really walking on the water, wasn't it? Because they were walking in that in faith and saying, Lord, show us what to do. And so that has been a tremendous team. I just want to say, well done. And it was outstanding service to the church, and they've done a great job. And all of you too who have continued in your various ministries of the church through these years, well done, good and faithful servants. And God will reward your faithfulness and your love that you've shown to, the, to his church. Now, Phil said the night that we were inducted here that you were a church in mourning. And I believe that's true. But I want to say today also, that came through that night as well, that this is a new day. And we remember those on whose shoulders we stand today. Dear Norman and Ruth, and all the pastors who have been before, Reverend Bell, who planted the church, and Norma. And we stand on the shoulders of all those people who have gone before, who have passed on the baton to us, that we might run our race now. And that's what we're going to do. And we thank God for the remembrance of them all, and for the power of the Spirit that's been working in here, and the love of God. And we're looking to Him to lead us on fully into the next phase of this work. And we believe, God, it's going to be a good time for the work and for the community, for you and for the community round about. So we praise God and look forward with expectation and hope to the future. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.
So that's probably the longest announcement you've ever heard. That <laughs> <laughs> It'll not be like that every week. But uh, we're going to have our children's song now and then followed by our children's video. to get ready to leave Egypt right away. He knew the Pharaoh might change his mind again, so they packed and left as fast as they could. I can't believe we're actually going. It's just as Moses promised. A land where we could be free. <laughs> it seems like a dream. But it's not a dream. At last, we're on our way home. Finally, the people of Israel left Egypt on the way to their homeland, the land of freedom. By day, a pillar of smoke guided them. And by night, a pillar of fire showed them the way. But back at the palace, the Pharaoh had changed his mind again. I was a fool to let them go. Who will build our pyramids and grow our food and, and fan me when it is warm? 
We must get the Israelites back. Call my chariot. In the meantime, the Israelites had reached the Red Sea. Moses, look behind us. The Pharaoh's army. They'll be here soon. Oh, no. Moses, what have you done to us? We would have been better off living unhappily in Egypt rather than dying here in the desert. Don't be afraid. God will protect us. Don't hurry, Moses. Rest tonight. Tomorrow morning, raise your hand and stretch out your staff over the sea. It will part, and you will be able to go through on dry land. I was thinking the same. <laughs> it's getting very exciting there. <laughs> well, we're going to have our Bible reading right now, so we're going to turn to Acts chapter 10, and we're reading there from verses 1 to 17. Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. And this is the gospel beginning to go to the Gentiles. This is a real breakthrough moment in the spread of the gospel. Because it's really from this moment that the gospel opens up to us. Up to this point, it's been very much a, a Jewish affair, but now it begins to open up through this man, Cornelius. So Acts chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. His lodging was Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and he saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet, bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. We'll just end our reading there. Lord, we ask you to bless your reading to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand again now. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. And through this, the boys and girls can go out to the children's church as well.
Well, we're going to see here this morning how the Lord breaks down prejudices in Peter against the Gentiles so that this man Cornelius and his household can be saved. Now, whether you like it or not, I think we all have to agree that we're all brought up with prejudices against other people. It's kind of naturally within us. In fact, I would say it's ingrained within us and we hate the idea of some other group of people, whoever they might be. And often when we meet actual people from that group, we don't feel the same animosity towards them on an individual level as we do when we think of them as a group. That's a strange thing, but I think it's quite true. You know, you'll say stuff like, can't stand them, or you couldn't like them if you reared them. <laughs> but our prejudices, as we'll see here this morning, can delay people coming to Jesus. We're not part of the solution to reach them. We become part of the problem. And the Holy Spirit works in us. Even as he calls them to Christ, he also works in us to break down those prejudices within us and change our hearts and attitudes. A few years ago, we met a wee couple from Northern Ireland uh, who are in Christian ministry. And they met at high school and eventually got married. But they came from opposite side of the tracts. One of them was a wee Catholic girl and the other was a young Protestant fellow. And so they were obviously attracted to each other if they ended up getting married and all of that. But whenever they first went out, the first kiss, and the fellow gave this, this wee girl a kiss, and the first thing he said was, Flip, I can't believe I just kissed a Catholic. <laughs> she remembers that. And her outlook was about Protestants was this. She says, them we Protestants, they're all going to hell because they don't believe the truth. And their attitudes changed and their tune changed when they got saved. When the love of Jesus came into their hearts, he removed their prejudices and replaced them with his love and with his grace. And our reading today, we're going to see Jesus changing Peter's heart. And so the first thing we see here is that Peter's on a journey. Ever since the first day he met the Lord Jesus, He's been on a journey where God is enlarging his heart and his capacity to love. Peter was brought up to be a devout Jewish man. He follows the customs of his people and their traditions, and he sees things through Jewish eyes. That's how he observes and understands the world. But this day that he met Jesus, this teacher from Nazareth, it, things begin to change. And it was revealed to Peter after a little while walking with Jesus that Jesus is the Messiah the saviour who was to come, who was to set up his eternal kingdom. And of course, as a Jew, Peter believed it was going to happen there and then. So that was another thing that had to change in him. So a lot of things that Peter believed and how he saw the world was challenged by Jesus. It wasn't easy being around Jesus because he would challenge the way you think and the things that you hold to be true because of the way you're brought up and the traditions that you've been brought up in. And Jesus challenges all of that. And first of all, his views, Peter's views within Judaism were challenged. He had been brought up in his community to understand that if you sinned, that something bad would happen to you. And so we see Peter and the disciples when Jesus heals a man who was born blind. And of course, they're stunned. They're stumped because they can't decide. Now, did this man sin? How could he have sinned if he was born blind? Maybe it was his parents that sinned. So they say to the Lord, Lord, did this man sin or did his parents sin that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither sinned. And so that must have been a real shock to them. Jesus said, this man's like this through the glory of God can be revealed in him when he gets healed. And then later on as they walked with Jesus, after Jesus had returned to heaven and poured out the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, Peter preached to this huge crowd of people. And that very day, the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people repented, believed in the Lord Jesus, were baptized in his name, and added to the church. No problem. These people were all Jews. And Peter just wanted to reach his people with the gospel, and he saw God saving them. It was tremendous, but it probably wasn't a big challenge to him or a big surprise. But the next thing happened, of course, as we know, was the gospel went to Samaria. There, to them. Sure, we despise them. 
And so Peter and John went down to see what the crack was and ended up praying with these Samaritans who they'd been brought up to despise. And then they saw these Samaritans receive the Holy Spirit just as the Jewish believers had. And it must have dawned on Peter and John and Philip too that God had not made a difference between these Jewish people and these Samaritan people who had received Jesus. So Peter began to be gradually opened up by God so that God's heart for all people will become Peter's heart too. And God doesn't compromise on sin. He hates sin, but he's reaching out to save the sinner. And in Joppa, we see Peter. He's moved on a bit here. He's in Simon the Tanner's house. The last time that we spoke, we saw that Simon would have been considered unclean by Jewish people because he worked with dead bodies of animals. And so Peter had come so far and that that was now okay with him. It didn't seem to bother him because in Simon's house, he was about to have something to eat as well. But what happened next was going to blow the sandals clean off him. And that's the second thing. It began with a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. And you just know when you hear this man's name that he's not Jewish. Cornelius is a Roman name. He was a Gentile. And if the Jews despised the Samaritans, well, they hated the Gentiles. A Jew wouldn't go into a Gentile's home and he wouldn't eat his food. They wouldn't sit down for a meal together. The Jews would see themselves as holy and they saw the Gentiles as unclean or common. There was no point of contact between them. Even when a Jewish person would return from a Gentile country, if he had to be away in business, when he got back over to the border of Israel, he would kick the soil or the dust off his feet of the Gentile land that he'd been to so that he wouldn't dirty the soil of Jerusalem or contaminate it by bringing in this evidence of the Gentiles. Now, this man, Cornelius, was a Roman soldier. The Italian regiment that he belonged to was an elite unit of volunteers from Italy, the homeland. The Roman army was made up of conquered peoples from many lands, but it was also made up of these elite guys who were the Roman legionaries themselves. And the Italian regiment were the true blues. They were the real McCoy. They kicked with the right foot. Their eyes were not too close together. No. <laughs> now, the interesting thing here is, of course, that Peter saw himself the same way. He thought he was the real thing. But Cornelius was in command of 100 men in the army. And somebody has compared his rank to a company sergeant major. So that was Cornelius coming through in this. And he had a, a quality about him that set him apart, that God recognized because he was a devout man, it says. Somewhere along the line, Cornelius had become exposed to Jewish teaching about the true God, and he had been drawn to it. God had been drawing Cornelius to himself. And although Cornelius wasn't circumcised, so he hadn't become a Jew, he has embraced practices from the Jewish faith. He would say he always prayed in his heart to God, and he used the pay that he got from his work to help Jewish people less well off than himself. He was given alms or charity to help people. And he had a genuine reverence for God. It said he feared God. And one day at three o'clock, while Cornelius was praying, he saw in a vision an angel, a messenger came from God and spoke to him by name and gave him very, very clear instruction. It said, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea, and he will tell you what you must do. So Cornelius is told, take down this address and send your people there to bring back Simon Peter. He has a message from God for you. The thing that you're seeking, Simon Peter carries the answer. So Cornelius is seeking God all right. And this instruction is the beginning of the answer. This is how he's going to get saved. And by the time four days have passed, Cornelius will be a new man because he will have believed the gospel and he himself will have been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. So the divining wall of prejudice has already been removed by Jesus on the cross and Cornelius and Peter are about to experience its effects. And what we see here is a divine appointment in the making. God is preparing Cornelius, and now he'll prepare Peter to receive these emissaries from this Gentile soldier so that Cornelius can be saved. 
The angel, you notice as well, didn't preach the gospel to Cornelius. The angel could well have told him, couldn't he, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, but he didn't. Because God has entrusted the privilege of sharing the gospel to us, to you and me. And he'll bring opportunity to cross our path that we must step into. So Cornelius sent two of his servants and a devout soldier to get Peter as the angel had instructed him. You'll notice something else here about Peter. He didn't send them away not knowing what they were doing. He brought them right into his confidence because he's an open-hearted man. And he told them all about the angel and he gave them the instructions that the angel had given him. And even though Cornelius is not saved, he's reaching out to others with the light that he has. So he's going to be tremendous, isn't he, once he gets saved in his understanding. Well, that's a challenge to us too, isn't it? Cornelius only had partial light. He was in this process of getting saved, and he was about to be saved, but he didn't know yet about the truth about Jesus. But you and I have the truth, because the Lord Jesus lives in us. And he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And therefore, we carry that truth in us, the person of Jesus Christ. Well, let me ask you this morning, do you reach out to others with the truth and the light that is within you? Cornelius was doing that. I, it comes across there in an exuberant way. He couldn't hold in what he had. How much greater was he going to be when he had the full revelation of the truth in Jesus? It's a challenge, that, isn't it? The Lord says, don't hide your light, but let, let the world see it. Well, the third thing here is that Peter's world is rocked by God. Peter's been challenged by Jesus the whole way, but he's about to get a real rocking now. The next day in Joppa, without knowing anything about what's happening with Cornelius, Peter heads upstairs onto the flat roof at midday to pray while Simon or somebody in the house cooks up some lunch. It would have been very hot at that time of the day, so Peter's probably under some kind of canopy to keep the direct sunlight off him. While he's there, he falls into a trance and God speaks to him. A bit like John on Patmos when he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Peter's now in the spirit on the top of Simon the Tanner's house. And he sees a vision of a large sheet let down from heaven. And in the sheet are all sorts of animals that God has forbidden the Jewish people to eat. And it's set out in their religious laws. You can read it in Leviticus 11 and Leviticus 23, that there's numerous animals there that the Lord will not allow the Jewish people to eat. They're unclean or they're common. And these food laws have the effect of putting a distance between God's people, the Jews, and between other people who aren't Jewish. They can't eat things that aren't kosher. And we all know that Jewish people, they don't like to eat pork. And so that's just one of the things there. There's many other things listed as well. Those things are forbidden to them in their food laws. And it meant that they couldn't mix easily with the pagan nations about them. It helped to, to keep them as God's people. That was the intention. In practice, it didn't work out very well because we know their history. But God shows Peter all these animals the Jews were forbidden to eat, and he says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter responds in true form, never, never, Lord. He disobeys what God tells him. And it's not the first time, is it? Because he tried to stop Jesus going to the cross. Remember when Jesus was saying to him, in three days I'm going up here and I'm going to die. they're going to be handed into the hands of sinful men. I'm going to be buried. But on the third day, the Son of Man will rise again. And Peter says, never, that'll never happen to you, Lord. And the Lord has to say, get behind me, Satan. You have a mind the things of men, not the things of God. So he wouldn't let Jesus go to the cross, but the Lord put him straight on that. And then when the Lord was showing his disciples a pattern of Christian leadership, when he was down putting a towel around his waist and washing his feet, and he comes to Peter, everybody else has submitted to it, and Peter says, never, Lord, not me, you'll not wash my feet. The Lord says, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part with me, Peter. And then he goes the other way, and he says, well, Lord, not just my feet, but my head and my hands as well. So he, this man of extremes. And uh, so the Lord corrects him about that as well. And each time the Lord rebukes Peter, and he straightens him out. And so the things that the Lord is telling him goes against the grain in Peter. He's prejudiced against these things. I imagine Peter saying to some friends, you know, lads, like, I have a real problem. I have to stop these reactions that just come out of me. If you see me saying no to God, would you just, you know, stop me? You need a friend like that, wouldn't he? Well, 
I imagine if there were friends with him up on the roof that day, there weren't, but imagine that there were, and they've seen Peter up there, he falls into a trance, he's praying, they're going to see that he's having some kind of spiritual vision, because they would have heard him saying to God in a horrified tone, never, he's done it again. And they're looking at each other and maybe saying, you know, friends, he's, re- he's reverting back, quick, intervention, stop him. But they're not there, of course, and Peter just blurts it out. And the Lord has to show him that vision three times so that he gets the message. And Peter often has to hear things three times. He denied the Lord three times. The Lord said to him three times, Do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And then here's three times, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And then the third time, every each time, the sheet's taken back to heaven. Now, Peter's ingrained prejudices are being broken down by God through this vision. This vision is a preparation for Peter's heart meeting Cornelius, but Peter doesn't know that yet. He's wondering what's this about. But God's desire to save other people is greater than our prejudices. He changed the grain in Peter's heart, and he's going to change the grain in our hearts as well. I'm going to carry on for another five minutes. And then we'll have our closing hymn. But I want you to hear this. The last point here is that Jesus changed the religious laws. Through this vision, he was abolishing those food laws so that everybody, God's heart would reach out and bring in all the people that he had marked for salvation. So when Jesus was born of a virgin, when he died on the cross to take away sin, when he rose from the dead, When he ascended into heaven and sat at the Father's right hand, he had fulfilled the old covenant and he brought in the new covenant. And now in this finished work, the dividing wall of hostility between God and man had been removed in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the dividing wall of hostility between people had been removed in the Lord Jesus as well. Because the Lord Jesus has made all these people one in himself. Galatians 3.28 says this, There is neither Jew nor Gentile. Now maybe this morning we begin to understand a little bit of what that means. These people were in animosity with each other. But in Christ, they brought together the dividing wall of hostility is gone. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. The chauvinists are gone. The feminists are gone. All are one in Christ Jesus. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's what Peter's vision is about. The gospel is not just for the Jews and for their cousins, the Samaritans. The gospel is for all mankind, for all people everywhere, for all time until the Lord Jesus returns. God summed it up in the words, what God has cleansed, you must not call unclean. What God has cleansed, you must not call unclean. So Peter's prejudices have to go because they're getting in the way of the gospel coming to Cornelius. And your prejudices and my prejudices have to go too because they're getting in the way of us bringing the gospel to other people. We're not meant to be a stumbling block to Jesus reaching others. We're here to help, not to be a hindrance. So Jesus will work in us too, just as he did in Peter, to remove those beliefs within us that are a barrier to his saving work, things that the gospel doesn't need. We belong to Christ now. Our first loyalty is to him. Everything else is subservient to that. So Jesus has taken this fisherman, Peter, and he's making him to be a fisher of men. And he will also take you and I and do the same things with us. You might say this morning, I don't like what you're teaching. Well, let me correct you on that if you're thinking that. You don't like what the Bible's teaching. Now, I find it hard too because it is a challenge to us. It goes against the grain. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. And that means a daily dying to ourselves so that Jesus might be seen in us and live through us. Or maybe this morning, you're maybe a bit more like Cornelius. You somehow find yourself attracted to God and and to church and the people of God and to Jesus himself, but you're not a full disciple because you haven't repented and put your trust in Jesus. But know this this morning, that whatever prejudices you have, Whoever you are, whatever background you're from, and whatever you've done, God loves you. And Jesus Christ died to take away your sins. And if you will stop trusting in yourself and call out on him and trust in the Lord Jesus, repenting of your sins, he will save you. And the wonder of it all 
is he can perform this miracle in your life today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And if you're a disciple of Jesus already and you're saying, I love you, Lord, and you're able to sing those hymns and all the rest, well, let him break down those things in you that are a stumbling block to you being effective in his service. I think that's more than enough for you folks to think about today. Let's ask God in his grace to bless us and help us. Lord God, we do thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the great work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And Lord, we thank you for the day and hour that you saved us. It was your work. You did it, Lord. We didn't add anything to it, and we can't take anything from it. And Lord, we give you all the glory for it today. Your grace came to us. Lord, you put the very desire within us to bring us to Christ. And Lord, that is an act of grace and mercy that we did never deserve. And so, Lord, today we thank you with all our hearts. We shall be forever grateful for saving us. And Lord, we thank you today that you have it in your heart to draw others unto Christ. And we pray, Lord God, you would do it this day that those that hear this who do not know Jesus are those, Lord God, who have drifted. We pray you would bring them back. We pray, Lord, you would save sinners today, cleansing them, transforming them, giving them new hearts, hearts that will worship and praise you. And Lord, we give you all the glory for your great work. And Lord, if you desire to use us in it, we thank you, Lord, and give you glory for that too. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to finish now with a very appropriate hymn, Jesus, Hope of the Nations. Let's stand, we'll sing this together. Father, we thank you for this time in your presence this morning. We pray, Lord, you'll have spoken to every heart and you'll have blessed and helped each one. Father, we thank you for our families this morning that are represented by us. We ask, Lord God, that your hand would be upon them to save and heal and deliver. 
Lord, that you'll draw near them. We pray, Lord, you'll be with us in this week, whatever it holds. And we pray, Father God, that your blessing would be upon your people. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.